sex industry respond to a lockdown? What happened to sex workers and what happened in the shadows? Since yesterday, July 1st, sex work is allowed again in this country. Will it go back to normal or will it have changed for good? Furthermore, it's easy to forget about pre-pandemic times, but at the beginning of this year, when the world knew nothing about Corona yet, there was already much to do about prostitution in Dutch politics. For example, some proposed to kind of stray away from our liberal Dutch approach to prostitution and move to a more restrictive Swedish approach. Furthermore, the mayor of Amsterdam wants to start a prostitution hotel and move prostitution out of the city center. In short, there is a lot going on surrounding prostitution and now is a very interesting time to address it. And today we'll be addressing it with Professor Marie-Louise Janssen. Her academic interests revolve around the intersection of sex work, migration and human trafficking. Not only has she researched this extensively, but she has also worked with sex workers in the field. With her Colombian colleague, they started Foundation Esperanza, which is an NGO that aims to combat human trafficking in Latin American women, as well as um, provides shelter and legal help to victims of human trafficking in the European sex industry. Marie-Louise, thank you very much for joining us. Mm, big pleasure to be here. <laughs> yeah, so my first question is that, as I said, sex work is, of course, almost the ultimate contact profession. How did the sex industry adopt or adapt to a lockdown? Yeah, well, so it's indeed an interesting time, uh, this corona times. Um, I think it has shown us different things. Um, in the first place, it has shown us how uh, we still have such enormous problem for accepting and recognizing sex work as a normal profession. It's still not seen as a full profession. Um, and uh, this is demonstrated clearly how we have treated sex workers in all these m uh, last months. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, in the March everything was locked down, but then in June slightly everything uh, started to open up again. All the contact professions were allowed to work except sex workers. So a clear exclusion uh, uh, has been made here for sex work. Um, uh, with the same reasoning like that um, uh, sex workers are not uh, allowed to work in a short distance, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, very uh, dangerous for infections, but uh, if you look at other contact professions like masseur or uh, physiotherapy, we see that every day all have been allowed to work except sex workers. So we see that they were still they are still not recognized as normal profession and not seen as a full profession and not seen as um, people who are making rational choices and who are very uh, aware of how to deal with infections and epidemics. Yeah, that's uh, if there's one group that knows how to deal with, uh, with these things, it, and that's uh, sex workers. They made a protocol uh, ex uh, how to deal with clients, but still they were not allowed to work. So, um, th so that's one thing that became very clear, uh, that we still have not accepted sex work as a normal profession. And I think also it made uh, very clear how um, sexuality and intimacy is for many people such an enormous important uh, role in their lives. Uh, suddenly we are uh, have to be social in social distance um, and we we recognize how important it is to have human contact if you only look at for example Pornhub uh, a, a famous porn mm -hmm. site it has in enormously in increased um, it's now in the top 10 for example of the famous websites visit most visited websites uh, after uh, Wikipedia so and before Amazon, by the way. Um, <laughs> so you see, uh, uh, p there is a need, uh, a human need here, for contact and intimacy. Uh, so I think it's it's worth looking at what is this need about? Why are we? Why do? Why is, has it become such enormous taboo? The commodification of sexuality or intimacy. Yeah. So like, that's of course super interesting. But do you think that, um, or do you know? Like how if the sex industry somehow still continued, maybe oh. online, maybe illegally, or was there just a big stop during the lockdown? 
Yeah, but you can imagine it, uh, thousands of sex workers have lost their job one day on the yeah. other. Um, and we talk many times of people who are uh, uh, in need for, for gaining money. It's the most important source of income. So if you cannot pay the rent, if you cannot give food to your children, um, uh, you cannot pay the basic needs, you have to continue. So yeah. that, meets, that means that many uh, sex workers were pushed into uh, uh, very vulnerable situations or to accept very vulnerable labor conditions to continue working. And the thing is that many uh, sex workers were also not qualified to receive the so-called TOSO arrangement uh, that is there for the, what we call set set payer, people uh, yeah. independent without personnel. Um, and uh, sex workers, many sex workers are in a situation that they are working in what we call an opting in uh, employment. Uh, so that's um, a gray area between independent worker and an employee, employed employee. Um, so they are neither independent nor employed, uh, so not benefiting any uh, um, uh, f from from an uh, uh, either independent worker yeah. or, or employed worker. Uh, so many were not qual uh, qualified to receive the TOSO arrangement as one of the only uh, a a few professions in the Netherlands. So yeah, more reason that they were very pushed in a very vulnerable situation. Um, and yeah, yeah so okay. as I said, again, it shows that we have problems with, the, with this profession and it shows that we still see the sex workers as immature, how many times victims of human trafficking who cannot make rational choices, which I think is very problematic. Yeah. So this was, of course, during the lockdown, but since yesterday, the 1st of July, sex work is allowed again in the Netherlands and Margrethe even specified that all positions are allowed again, which I thought was very, very funny. Yeah. Um, but does this mean that sex work will simply go back to normal the way it was before the pandemic? Um, well, yeah, so many sex workers will start working again, of course. But at the same time, we see uh, many restrictive measures, policy measures that are being introduced, which makes working for many sex workers uh, very difficult if not impossible. Could and many windows, an well, many windows are, for example, closed down. We only have now 300 windows in the red light in Amsterdam, for example. Um, it's very difficult for many sex workers to uh, get a license to work, uh, as, as well as, as mm -hmm. also outside the big cities. So uh, it's still, yeah, as I said, not treated as a normal work. And many uh, sex workers are not allowed to work or... Uh, um, find difficulties to find working places. And do you think maybe a new problem could be that also on the customer side, um, people will now be more afraid because of the pandemic to to go to the red light district? Yeah, well, I wonder uh, if clients are so afraid uh, <laughs> because they know that sex workers are professional workers and they know how to deal with the situation. As I said, they made a protocol how to uh, deal with clients, uh, w what's allowed, what's not allowed, um, how to uh, how to take this one half meter into account. So I think many sex, many clients will uh, go quietly again visiting <laughs> sex workers. Okay. Yeah, so at the beginning of this year, before the corona crisis, there was also already a lot of debate about prostitution. Mm -hmm. um, and two reasons for this was that politicians were shocked by things that came to light about conditions in certain red light districts, as well as that uh, the National Officer for Human Trafficking warned that there's still a lot of sexual exploitation and trafficking going on. And that's what I want to turn a bit to now. Mm -hmm. So... For the audience, the Dutch model of prostitution is very liberal. So um, prostitution is legal as long as you have a license. And the idea behind like more or less legalizing prostitution was that it's then easier to control and regulate constitution, um, prostitution. But then my question is, why do we then still see so much human trafficking and exploitation? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think when it comes to sex work uh, and you look at the public debate and the political debate, what's important is to ask critical questions. Mm -hmm. um, and one critical question uh, is who is saying what on what kind of evidence? Um, 
So uh, when it comes to sex work, then we see that there is a kind of um, um, e easy uh, acceptance that the sex work policies, so that as you explained, mm -hmm. um, in the Netherlands has been failed uh, because there is still human trafficking. Um, now, I think one critical question to ask here is how can we combat human trafficking? And are sex work policies the best way to uh, combat an international organized crime, which is human trafficking? Um, so if, if we look at the sex industry as mm -hmm. a specific industry where human trafficking is happening, um, and by the way, that's not only the sex industry we see in agriculture, we see in horticulture, with domestic work, we see human trafficking happening. Um, but all the focus always has been on the sex industry, uh, while this is only part of the problem, uh, human trafficking. So, but if you look at um, uh, the, uh, the phenomenon of human trafficking, which is indeed occurring in the sex industry, uh, and if you look at the, at the victims of this crime, we see a huge problem that there is enormous discrepancy between real victims who have pressed charges against human trafficking mm -hmm. and uh, estimated victims. So what we see uh, in the policy documents uh, and also the, in the discourse by politicians on sex work, that they always refer to um, an estimated number of uh, victims of human trafficking or the category that's being used in the report is potential victims of human trafficking. So if you look at these potential victims of human trafficking in the Netherlands, we see it's around 6,000 victims of human trafficking in the Netherlands, uh, of whom half of them are being uh, trafficked in the sex industry. But we still talk here about potential victims of human trafficking. Now, if we look at the real cases of human trafficking, mm -hmm then we see every year between 90 and 110 legal cases on human trafficking in the sex industry are, uh, are happening in the legal court. Of um, uh, just only a small part of this uh, 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 trafficking concerns um, deception. So people who are being uh, deceived about the nature of work and who are being forced into the work, mm -hmm. 16%. Um, which means that the rest of all these trafficking cases um, is about um, excessive labor exploitation. So then the question here is how can we combat labor exploitation in the sex industry yeah. if we want to combat human trafficking? And that's an interesting question to, 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 to look at um, because if you look at the real problems that are occurring, uh, it's about exploitation, exploitative, abusive labor conditions mm -hmm. in the sex industry. Um, it's also about violence. It's about the huge stigma that is still attached to the work. Um, it's about, uh, for example, mandatory uh, drugs use. So all kind of forms of abusive uh, uh, practices. Um, so I would say if politicians in the Netherlands are really interested in the well-being of sex workers, and if they are really uh, willing to combat human trafficking in the sex industry, the first thing they should look at is mm -hmm. how can we make sex workers less vulnerable uh, to f to for exploitative labor conditions. And how? And that's a big challenge. But that's another discussion. But how do you think that could work? Like, what are concrete things that we can do, or politicians can do, to ensure that? Um, they're in less of a vulnerable position to be exploited. Yes, mm, that's a good question, and, and that's also part. That should be a part of the debate, indeed. Yeah. Uh, so I think there are many things the government could do. If you ask sex workers uh, what's the main problem, as I said, they mm -hmm. will answer the stigma. So I would say there's a huge challenge here for the government uh, to start, for example, anti-stigma campaigns. A huge anti-stigma campaign. Why do we have such a problem with sex work? Uh, why is it so stigmatized? Um, so there's, a, I would say, a clear task here for, for the government. Um, but other forms, I would say, uh, 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 how to combat abusive labor conditions, yeah. uh, to make sure people have a, a labor contract, that labor legislation is being, uh, uh, put in, uh, uh, is being exercised in places of sex industry. <coughs> um, Violence, for example, is a very interesting project which is called uh, National Ugly Mugs, which is a pioneer organization in Australia. 
and now it's um, uh, working in UK, mm -hmm. which is focused on uh, how can we um, help sex workers to report cases of violence or, um, uh, or, or yeah, exploitative uh, labor conditions. Um, so that's a very clear project that could be introduced, I think, also in the Netherlands, how to uh, reinforce a sex workers' position, uh, that they are able to uh, press charges against violence or uh, abusive practices, uh, that they are um, uh, feel that they get support uh, to get better access to uh, legal assistance and protection by the government. Another thing I would could think of is more uh, in the term in relation to academic research. There's mm -hmm. an enormous, I would say, need for evidence-based research on sex industry. Um, what, for example, what are the services that are being provided? What are people looking for if they are looking uh, 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 at Pornhub, for example, uh, which is so, such an enormous vis uh, visited website? Um, wh what does this cons demand site consist of? Um, yeah, uh, how can we make sure that uh, there is an enormous diversity in the industry? I, I think, I mean, there are, uh, besides abuse, abusive conditions in the labor, condi in the sex industry, you see also, I would say, in um, very uh, stereotypical imagery, a sexist, racist imagery, um, stereotypes, stereotypical bodies in the sex industry. So I think there's a crying need here for innovation. Uh, new bodies, different di uh, diversity when it comes to gender, diversity when it comes to sexuality, uh, uh, diversity of bodies, of services. So, yeah, evidence-based research um, and, and discussing and, and uh, uh, investigating how this industry can be innovated. Yeah, yeah some, something else I w am very interested in is kind of how what we do in the Netherlands compares to what other countries are doing. So mm -hmm. like how they kind of regulate mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And I think the two countries I found most interesting in this regard were like Sweden on the one side and then New Zealand on the other. Exactly. Um, and yeah, I would like you to explain kind of where do we as the Netherlands stand in between Sweden and New Zealand, and what's your personal preference uh, for for these models, and which one is also the best for the well-being of uh, sex workers? Yeah, oh, yeah, and uh, indeed, especially the last thing I think <laughs> should be a leading question yes. here. Um, so, so we see indeed two opposed systems uh, in Sweden. It's, it's characterized by a criminalization of clients. Um, and uh, yeah, um, so sex work is not being illegal, but uh, as soon as she's entering in contact with client, she's, she's the, the, the act becomes illegal and the client becomes criminalized. Um, and then we have indeed New Zealand, which is uh, where we see a form of decriminalization of sex work. So I would say the Netherlands is somewhere in the middle, like many other countries. Uh, uh, we always say it's a, a legalization, but actually, um, being a sex worker has been for a long time already legal, but it's more about it's more that the, the ban on brothels has been lifted from the uh, penal code. So it means that uh, uh, since 2000, having a brothel facilitating sex work has become legal. Uh, so that's a difference. So, but it's still highly regulated, and we see that constantly all kind of restrictive measures are being introduced. It's Needing to have a license, for example. For right. example. Or the, uh, one of the things of in what we see in the law proposal, the VRS, uh, which is a law proposal to register sex workers, um, that's being discussed now. I, I would say it's a um, half-hearted form of regulation somewhere in the between uh, uh, complete decriminalization and complete criminalization, as in Sweden. So, as you said, I would say the leading question should be here, what is in uh, the best for sex workers? Yeah. Like we would do with any other economic sector. Uh, if you, we would like to change the, the, uh, the situation of lecturers at the University of Amsterdam, for example, you, the first thing you ask is, what is needed? How can we improve these conditions? So in Sweden, then, we see that um, uh, in 2000, uh, th they start to criminalize clients uh, because 
the act of selling sexual services to clients was seen as highly problematic by the, the, the national government in Sweden. Um, it was seen as a form of violence, violence committed by men against women. Um, so the, the, the idea behind these policies is to uh, send out a normative signal to the world that Sweden is not accepting sex work, which is in their eyes a form, always a form of violence. So you could say that's a form of what we might call symbolic politics. Uh, you send out normative signals and you want to yeah, send out an, an image about the national sexuality that you as a country uh, consider uh, an, 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 uh, yeah, a, a normative form of sexuality. So you see that it's not so much the well-being of sex workers, neither the clients, that is uh, in, uh, important here, but it's more the image of a country uh, and to, to send out a normative signal. Um, and you see indeed that the, the that, uh, criminalization of clients is having very direct harmful uh, consequences for sex workers because they are not allowed to work anymore. Um, so it's not in the benefit of sex workers. Um, so um, in the Netherlands then, uh, if you read the reports, uh, the governmental reports, and, uh, um, and also now the new law proposal, we see that uh, at least in word, mm -hmm. the well-being of sex workers is important. Uh, at least that's, uh, uh, verbally, that's verbally the case. So, uh, so well, taking then the well-being of sex workers and, uh, as a starting point, I, I am convinced that the best situation for a sex worker and the client is a legal environment where a sex worker can speak up in case of violence, when, where a sex worker can go to the police quietly and say, this person has done this to me or this is happening, these abusive conditions. This, the, a legal environment is the only way that... Um, sex works are, ze are seen as uh, yeah, legal uh, uh, workers with a legal voice. I remember um, when I was working in Foundation Esperanza, as you, as you said in the beginning, we were um, uh, dealing with a woman who was a victim of trafficking from Albania. And so we asked her, uh, well, yeah, well, you have the possibility in the Netherlands to press charge against your traffickers. So she was really doubting and she, she didn't want to do it because she was afraid of reprisals, measures of reprisals from the traffickers. And then uh, she went home and then uh, being in Albania, then she thought, well, I, mean, I should maybe press charges now against traffickers. So she went to the police and she said, well, I would like to press charge against trafficking. And then the police officer said, who are you? You are just a hooker. S so she, she didn't have any legal voice because uh, it's, it's, it's criminalized in, in Albania. So, so therefore, I think it's, it's necessary um, uh, to, for an, a legal environment that sex workers can speak up if we are really in, uh, 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 interested in her well-being or their well-being. Um, uh, she should ha there should be a legal environment. So I think it's time now that we in the Netherlands recognize the social role of sex work in our, in our society and also the legal role of sex work in society. And it's time now that we recognize it as a, as a legal full profession. Yeah, and maybe also that we stop kind of pretending like we are the most progressive country when it comes to prostitution, right? Because that's, I think, something I, I have thought in my life, but then I saw that in, in countries like New Zealand, it's actually a lot more legal than it's here. So Yeah, so it's decriminalized in, yeah. in, 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 in uh, New Zealand. So that means that there's no special law uh, addressing sex work, only in case of, of crime, of course, but then, then we, we talk about the criminal law. Um, while in the Netherlands, we still have and are still introducing all kind of policies, specific policies. I would say we have to, to introduce the labor legislation here. And if there uh, are forms of crime, like rape or, 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 or uh, human trafficking, then there, is a sp there are specific articles uh, to address this. Yeah, yeah so another specific policy that, um, yeah, that got a lot of commotion or caused a lot of commotion was... Uh, Femke Halsema's proposal, so she's the, the mayor of Amsterdam, mm -hmm. and she wants to move sex work um, mm -hmm. outside of the red light district to a prostitution hotel. And her goal is kind of to 
prevent the nuisance and disrespect that prostitution sometimes face in a red light district from passerbys and also increasingly tourists. However, um, according to the interest group Red Light United, 93% of the sex workers that work in the red light district actually don't want to move and they don't want to go to such a prostitution hotel. So I was wondering, how can this discrepancy be explained where Femke Halsema wants to do this for the benefit of the sex workers, but most of them don't want to move to red light districts? Yeah, so you can wonder well, why, yeah, she, why what's she's going doing wrong. what she's doing. <laughs> yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I think it's an interesting case, yeah, what's happening now with the Walle. Um, uh, it's, I would say it's clear that there are uh, there is a kind of untenable situation now. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the enormous amount of, of sex tourists um, are yeah, a, a huge disturbance, you could say, for the area. Mm-hmm. So uh, w- uh, what happens, is, uh, what, what is in any way needed, I think, when new policies or, or new initiatives are arising and being p- pra- put in practice, all the parties that are involved here should be uh, sit on the table. Yeah. Sex workers, local inhabitants, local shopkeepers and clients. I think that those are the direct uh, 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 related to, to sex work. Um, they should sit on the table from the beginning, but also during the whole process until the very end. And this is not happening nowadays. Uh, so we, the sex works, for example, were being at, uh, uh, advised in the beginning, but then uh, they were not continuing uh, 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 and discu- uh, at the discussion at the table. Um, so that's one thing. So all the parties should be involved, I think. Um, uh, I must say, I, um, I find it very courageous from from Femke Halsema that she is willing to open up the whole industry and see well at least at the ballen and see how could we introduce um, new forms mm-hmm. of legal sex work um, outside this very small old city center. Uh, I found it courageous um, and uh, f- I would say it could be also a very interesting opportunity to start innovating the sex industry. Um, but not in this way? Or would you be well, in favor of such a hotel? I would say it's an interesting initiative to think further, yes. Okay. Um, and Because, um, well, having all these parties sitting on the table, eh, by the way. Mm-hmm. So, and f- of course, in the first place, the sex workers, because they should be very involved in this. Because who, know, who better knows what's needed and what are uh, safe working conditions as sex workers. Um, but to have an uh, uh, in Eros Center, as she calls it, mm-hmm. um, we, I would say the first place it should not be outside the city center, because then you have these isolated areas and sex workers, sh- sex workers should go there uh, and maybe it's unsafe conditions. So I would say together with sex workers, she okay. should look for a place that is easily be easily uh, uh, reachable for, for sex work, safe conditions. And it offers a possibility to create another legal uh, working space um, where we can have a more innovative sex industry. As I said, diversity, diversity of gender, diversity of sexuality, of the services, um, control, um, uh, 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 um, safe conditions. Um, so it, it's, I would say I, um, it's more a, a new opportunity to create something new. I must say, I, in, in, I was in January, I was in Curaçao, where mm-hmm. I'm doing research on, a, on a, um, the so-called state brothel in Curaçao, which is called Kappen van Legeren in Willemstad, mm-hmm. which is now closed down, by the way, by, also by COVID-19. Um, and I visited this brothel and I thought, this is an interesting way of thinking about how to reorganize uh, the sex industry in, 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 in an Eros center, mm-hmm. uh, but introducing uh, diversity of sexual That's what they're services. doing there. Well, th- I, I would say it, it was an interesting place um, to uh, start innovating, I would say. Because okay. you see a lot of sex work, you see a lot of clients, uh, you see um, striptease shows, there's also a casino. So there's a kind of, yeah, uh, uh, a center to, yeah, to, to sexual center with lo- a variety of sexual services could be more diverse. 
because you, you saw mainly female uh, uh, sex workers, uh, cisgender sex workers um, strip doing striptease. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot to improve. But it's interesting. It was highly controlled. Um, a doctor was ev uh, was visiting the brothel uh, every week. So yeah, I think it's an interesting initiative. So you think we might actually be seeing these prostitution hotels come in the future? I think if it's attractive enough for the sex workers, if you make it attractive enough for sex workers and clients, it might be a very interesting initiative. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll speak again in uh, in a couple of years and see what happens. And visit it. And visit it, of course. <laughs> so another kind of futuristic, now that we're talking kind of about experimenting and stuff anyway, mm -hmm. um, to me is sex robots. So that's also a development that sex robots are getting more and more humane and realistic. Mm -hmm. And do you think... At some point, sex robots could even substitute <laughs> sex workers, or is that really a bridge too far? Well, yeah, I mean, the sex industry is an enormous dynamic industry. Mm -hmm. uh, it's constantly changing and, and uh, growing as well. Um, so uh, the technical in inventions that we see now with the sex robot is, of course, one part of the industry. Um, and I think there's definitely a, a market for it. I mean, there, there are brothels in Barcelona, for example, with, with sex dolls. So it's not, not something new, it's happening already. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's part of the industry. However, as I said in the beginning, there is also a, always this, this human need of many people of this human contact and intimacy to touch somebody, for example. Uh, t um, so this cannot be replaced by a robot. I mean, partly, but there will still be a desire for this human contact. So, yeah, I think it's interesting uh, development, and it should also be investigated, because, yeah. as I said, we know very little about the demand side. Um, but it would not uh, replace completely a human contact. Yeah, the robots won't take over yet. I don't <laughs> think so. Yeah, and then another... So for the foreseeable future, they won't take over. Um, but I do still think it's interesting to look at at what potential negative side effects could be of, of having them. Because when I try to think about it, I mostly mostly found positive things, actually, because mm -hmm. uh, people can really let free their desires, but like robots can also not experience like, exploitation or, or pain. Um, or trafficking, for that matter. So that all seems positive. But what could be potential downsides to having more robots in the sex industry? Well, I mean, the first downside I see that it's if you look at these robots, it's still very stereotypical bodies. Um, so again, it's lacking diversity of bodies or uh, uh, in terms of gender and sexuality, uh, ethnicity. So we should challenge these stereotypes. Um, so uh, the sex robots would be an interesting uh, moment to challenge this. Um, what about transgender robots, for example? There's so many things to, to think of. Um, so so that, that's, I would say, the f yeah, first downside. Um, and um, yeah, well, I, I'm not afraid that it will replace uh, other contexts. So actually, I don't see so many downsides of it. Do you see any downsides of it? No, that's why I was asking. <laughs> but I... It's steeper, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you can, of course... Uh, you, I mean, that's something that should be investigated. What are the consequences of this? We don't yeah. know. We can presume things that people might uh, become more insensitive yeah, towards human contact. We don't know. I mean, uh, th this is interesting f uh, terrain for, uh, for research, I would say. Evidence-based research here. Oh, nice. Maybe for my, my thesis exactly. next year. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, two more questions, I would say, and then, mm -hmm. then it's time to wrap up. Mm -hmm. So, I was wondering, because you were talking, uh, or you brought it up multiple times, that we should diversify the sex industry, mm -hmm. different bodies, mm -hmm. not just uh, cisgender mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. So, what could, we, what could be a way... To, to practically diversify the sex industry? Would this be like a kind of approaching different groups or starting to advertise to non-stereotypical prostitutes? Or 
how how does this work? No, if you look at images, if you look, for example, at red light, and you mm-hmm. look at all the images that you see, the naked bodies, you mainly see white uh, cisgender uh, bodies. So uh, this is very cl- e- uh, easy to to intervene here and to show diversity um, in terms of images. Um, uh, the surfaces, of course, can be uh, diversified. Um, uh, what about men behind the window, or or male, more uh, um, straight uh, uh, male sex workers, for example? Uh, m- much more gay sex work, um, uh, like uh, lesbian porn, uh, fem fem porn. I mean, so many th- surfaces you can diversify. Um, the, the, the many people are not only looking for sexuality, it's also this intimacy burlesque shows, for example, that's uh, addressing more uh, yeah, e- eroticism. Uh, it's, just, it's not only sex, but, but it's uh, yeah, eroticism, sensuality. Um, yeah. So, I mean, there are, there are that's a saunas, uh, mm. you can think of everything. That's what. That's why I think an eros center sounds interesting, because if it's really an eros center, then my fantasy can go wild there. <laughs> yeah. So finally, um, we already touched upon it a little bit indirectly, but before the Corona crisis, politicians were talking, and more and more voices were talking about maybe having a national law um, for prostitution. So not just all on the municipal Mm -hmm. level, but the national law. And if you could give advice to basically the people discussing this, what do you think is is something that that politics overlooks when when discussing about sex workers and uh, the prostitution industry? Um, Well, so first I would say the enormous stigma it is. Uh, I can't say it enough. It's so uh, harmful for sex workers. And as I said, if you listen to them, that's their main problem. So the stigma is definitely overlooked. And then we see this enormous conflation between human trafficking and sex work that's always occurring in debates on sex work, like, like we are doing now also. Uh, so this, is, um, uh, this conflation then uh, is overlooking all those sex workers who are not victim of human trafficking uh, and who also might ex- uh, experience maybe uh, violence or uh, a lack of protection from the government or difficulties to get access to, to legal uh, support, um, uh, who have difficulties to press charges against certain clients, violent clients. So we are overlooking then all these sex workers who are not a victim of human trafficking because of this conflation. Um, and another thing, indeed, is that because of this license system that's mm-hmm. being discussed now, we see that some municipalities are allowing sex work in their uh, in their municipality and or city or or village, and others are not. So there's a co- every city has its autonomy. Uh, so then you see that, for example, in Eindhoven, it might be very difficult to get a license for, for example, receiving clients at home, while in, S- in Amsterdam there are more possibilities. So um, in that sense, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's um, a national policies might be indeed more, uh, 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 more effective. Um, and then if you think of uh, uh, problems that sex workers are... Um, encountering in the industry besides the stigma for example um, you see uh, uh, so sex work in the Netherlands is to a great extent migrant work so with migrant workers we see enormous high mobility that they are traveling constantly Um, I think what's important uh, how I would envision the improvement of position of migrant workers Mm -hmm. is that if they arrive in the Netherlands that there is a kind of agency, or, pa- or it could also be a part of the trade union, proud for sex workers, that they can get complete, uh, clear information about their rights in the Netherlands, uh, or labor contracts, um, what human trafficking means if they encounter human trafficking, mm-hmm. uh, so where they can get all kind of uh, information in relation to their migrant condition, but also in relation to sex work. So information 
uh, legal information, support, and therefore we need a very strong trade union. And that's exactly the, po the, the problem now. We have now a very weak trade union because of lack of, of financial support from the government. So, so if you are really concerned about well-being of sex workers, I would say the first thing that is needed is a very strong trade union that's like a tiger behind sex workers. Then you really show uh, that you are uh, really uh, interested in well-being of sex workers. Then what is happening now in this law proposal that's a kind of half-hearted policies, uh, mostly addressing human trafficking, and not um, a tiger. And not a tiger, <laughs> exactly. Okay, well, thank you very much for being here today. I definitely learned a lot, and I hope you all did too. And um, yeah, stay tuned for some more podcasts during the summer. But of course, we'll actually resume again um, at the start of the new academic year because we also have to take a bit of a break. So um, yeah, tune in later. Bye.